<laughs> and we're live. Yeah. Well, I don't know. We're going to need a minute while everybody logs in and gets going here. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, no matter where you are in the world. Um, Maddie, we got live chat in the bottom corner of that screen, right? Say hello to the folks out there. I don't get to do anything today. And okay, so now I know what I'm looking for. All right, people are logging in now. Here we go. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Okay, yes, there we go. All right. Well, for everybody who's uh, going to be a second or two late, that's fine. When they join us, we can do some recapping. Um, obviously, uh, I'm Jeff. We're here today to talk about a grim subject, but I think it's going to be really important. Um, first of all, let's do some channel business. The show today is going to be dedicated to helping people who've been affected by recent storms. Um, we're going to cover a lot of disaster restoration information. I've got a good chunk of my career in that industry while I hone my skills, so I know what it is that I'm talking about. And I'm going to be sharing uh, experiences and stories and tips and tricks for you for navigating that world. Also wanted to uh, have some live call-ins with the members after we get through that segment. Uh, if you do have, a, if you're a member and you have a disaster restoration question, that'd be, you know, more ideal. I will answer general questions, but I'd be more interested in hearing from people who are in that storm recovery kind of situation or you've had flooding or a fire. Um, we'll try to keep on topic as best we can, but of course, you know, if you're a member and you call in, we're going to answer your question. Okay, let's put it that way. Now, if you are watching and you're not familiar with our membership program, there is a join button on the screen on our homepage. You can join to become a member. Uh, all membership privileges are the same across the board. You just pick whatever level you feel uh, you'd like to join our membership at. And we are happy to help you out. And you can use the email to send us pictures and get information on your particular project. Now that I'm talking about it, I also need to a massive apology to our members. I am four days behind on the email. Ooh, shame on Jeffrey. The reality is, is where we are, uh, winter is coming really quickly. And we're not quite done the exterior work that requires certain temperatures to do things like cement. <laughs> and so we have been busting our butts the last week or so trying to get all the outdoor project finished. And as a result, I've been coming home extremely tired and sore and jumping into my little inflatable hot tub to try to not feel so old. Um, this weekend, I'm going to dedicate all my time to getting back up to speed on my email. So if you're a member, thank you for your patience. If I've upset you, I apologize. Um, but I will be back on top of this game in just a few minutes. And we will get to all of your questions later. Look at that chat just exploding all right, so what we're going to do here today is if you are a subscriber or just a regular YouTube viewer and you've bumped across our channel and you've got a question, um, Matt, this will be for you. If you are watching this and you see somebody um, do a like a super, what do they call that, super chat? Yeah, I'm still such a newbie. If you want to do a super chat and get a question answered from me while we're doing the show, I am okay with that. But I want it to be about the subject matter today, okay? Once we're taking phone calls, if you want to super chat and get a question later, that's fine. But let's try to keep this on topic. We're going to do a lot more of this now that we have a studio. So we'll be able to answer a lot more different kind of varieties of questions as we go along. But here we are. Let's dive into this thing. Okay. Love warning signs. That's really good. All right. Um, cheers, Simon. Appreciate the, the shout out there, man. That's awesome. Uh, Lance, yeah, you like that Bigger Pockets episode? We're actually going to be shooting an episode with David and um, everything okay over there? The Bigger Pockets guys, they're going to be joining us on our studio on our channel. We are starting a new podcast channel really soon, okay? It's just about timing. So I need to have the time to do it. <laughs> so we are going to get, uh, get that project wrapped up at the farmhouse on the outside first before we take on any more. Um, and then we'll do our podcast. I'm also planning to travel to KBIS, the big trade show, National Builder Show in February. It's going to be crazy. 
we're looking to put together a booth down there so we can do podcast interviews with all of the up and coming products and suppliers and distributors and companies that are down there and make that content so that we can bring you a live home show, right? So you don't have to go. <laughs> it's a safer way to shop, right? If you like that idea, then like this video today because we are going to be upsetting the natural course of things and that is what I'm all about. Hey, Sandy is back. Good to see you again, Sandy. Yeah, I got a lot going on. Did I even bother to tell you? I ha I'm gonna drop a bomb here. I didn't even talk about it, but I'm gonna drop a bomb. We've been working feverishly in the back, behind the scenes. We're currently having a bunch of our videos dubbed by a fantastic individual down in Columbia who's a national radio voice for Columbia. And we have a whole team down in Columbia changing our content into the Spanish language. All right? Because nobody wants to read subtitles and watch what I'm doing while I'm working. And to be honest with you, he has a much better sounding voice than I do. So I think <laughs> the Spanish channel will be even better than this. Um, so that is coming up real soon. We'll be launching that in just a couple weeks. So a lot happening. If that works out, okay, then we are looking to do the same thing with a bunch of other languages around the world. Bottom line, teaching channels. We've got to teach in the language that the people are watching in. So we're prepared to make that investment to help people out. And I'm really looking forward to getting that done. I'm being more in the green bottle beside you. Yeah, well, this today, the drink of the day is actually just water. Uh, <laughs> I'm in recovery mode because I've been working too hard. And ever since I went to Europe, I've been stuck. I can't get off the bubbles. Love me some good old-fashioned uh, soda viz. All right? So, without any more delay, let's just jump into this. Today's topic is disasters, disaster restoration. And I want to break this down because it is very distinct in this industry that there are two sides of that coin. There's a disaster response, and then there's the restoration side of things. And as a consumer and a homeowner, you need to understand that those are two completely different areas. Disaster companies generally specialize in the response. And to a certain degree, they, they respond to the point where the site is now safe to be worked on. Okay? Does that make sense? So they'll do emergency repairs. They'll do emergency weatherproofing. And that's like tarps. Um, they'll get rid of water. They'll remove things that have been affected by water. And they'll leave a site in a condition where it's able to dry. And then once it's dry, they'll actually come and clean it. So it'll deal with all the molds and bacteria and that sort of thing. Now, that's the response. And in most cases, disaster response is going to be covered under your insurance without any issue. I don't want to talk too much about the insurance world today because not every disaster is covered by insurance. Everywhere you go in this world, insurance companies take on different risks and they'll actually put in there, we don't cover this, we don't cover that. Where I live, uh, we have window wells. And if you have an older house, your window might only be an inch or two higher than the ground. And we can get a couple feet of snow here. So what they don't cover is water infiltration that gets in under the window jam between the stone and gets in behind your walls. That's not covered. For some people, that can be a real traumatic event because you can get a lot of water coming in through a driveway under a window well. Anyway, I want to deal with the response first and then the restoration because they're two different sides of the coin. First of all, disaster response. As a homeowner, I want to just say this. I have had enough experiences with people who in the midst of a disaster, and we'll break this down. I don't want to use the word disaster all day long. If you have a fire, get the hell out, okay? If you have a flood, there's a different approach. For whatever reason, a lot of homeowners, when they get flooding in their houses, they feel empowered to do something about it. They feel motivated to say, I'm going to tackle that rising water. Now, there is a big difference between flooding in a basement and, and flooding of a neighborhood, okay? And I'm not going to get into uh, FEMA situations, okay? But I am going to deal with this. If you have a massive rainstorm, 
and for whatever reason, the water is coming up through your basement and is filling up in your house, generally that's a sign that the, the rain system has been overwhelmed and now it's backing up because the sewer, street sewers are connected to the other sewers to the go to the houses. And a lot of people have got houses that don't have modern construction with backflow preventer valves so that the water can travel right up the other direction, going the wrong way, and then come out of a toilet or a floor drain or something else in your basement and start filling your basement with water. That water is officially called sewage. <laughs> it's dirty, all right? It's nasty. And if you have that happening in your home, I'm going to guarantee you there's nothing you can do about it. I don't want you to try. I don't want you grabbing pails and running up and down the stairs and throwing the water outside. Until that water event stops, it won't start going back down again. There's nothing you can do to protect your home. If you get one inch of water or one foot of water, it makes no difference on the restoration side of things, okay? But the amount of energy it can take to try to tackle that event, well, I'll just share this story. I was called to do a restoration because the response had already been dealt with of a, of a backup. Sewer backup happened, you know, uh, the husband being the man that he is, went downstairs, tried to tackle it, trying to shop vac and empty and shop vac and empty all night long. Um, he ended up having a heart attack and died on the spot. I got called in with my team. We go through the front door. We met the widow. This is a few weeks later. We got to fix this house. And all we see on the walls are all the little black rubber marks from the gurney from the ambulance attendants. And it was, it was rather upsetting because I know that every day since that event, that lady had been reminded of the event by those marks. It was unnecessary, all right? We hear all the time in the wintertime, hey, don't shovel your driveway if you're old, you know, take breaks, hire someone else to do it. You can, you can too much physical exertion is, is not a good thing. So the point I'm making here is, had that individual understood that if he had one inch or one foot of water, it wouldn't have made a difference. He could have just walked away and left it there. All right. And I'm going to explain the process for the restoration later so that you'll understand better. But the bottom line is, if you're getting a flood in your basement, there's nothing you can do to mitigate that. Even when you call the insurance company and the flood restoration people, what we would do is we would show up and we would be like, Yep, you've got water in your basement. We would have you sign a piece of paper saying that we're going to deal with it. Drop off a fan, all right? We call it in the industry, it's like, it's like peeing on a tree like a dog, marking his territory, okay? And we go, we leave. <laughs> because until the water vent's over, there's nothing we can do about it, even with pros and trucks and pumps and everything else. There's nothing we can do to help you out until the water starts going the other direction. So... Now that you know this, you can resist the temptation to jump in and try to save the day because there's nothing you can do to stop the, the, the situation. And it does not make a difference. So don't be a victim of your own you know, ambition there. That's dangerous stuff. Now, wow, that just had a really wild echo when I did that, man. That was a male stop doing that. Cheapers, creepers. All right. Ah, um, there's a lot of different kinds of things that can happen to your house. Uh, you can have fire. You can have just a small fire, but with a lot of smoke damage, right? And like, I don't want to talk about if your house blows up completely. Let's talk about a lot more common things. You have a small kitchen fire. Maddie, can you pull up that picture real quick of a kitchen fire? Nope. <laughs> uh, anyway. He'll get this in a second, and he'll share it with you. Here it is. Okay. Now, and can I get my screen to see, so I can see exactly what everyone else is seeing when you're done? All right, thanks. When you get a kitchen fire, and, well, if you get a kitchen fire, it's not a guarantee. Uh, the house itself is designed to not burn to the ground if you can get a fire under control within 20 minutes. Okay. That's your window. Now, 
if you have a fire and you can't put it out immediately just by putting the lid on the burning pot or something, the best thing to do is just get out of the way because it's not the fire that's going to be the problem. It's going to be the smoke. All right. We're good. All right. All right. So this is what I'm looking at. Now, you will see in this picture that the ceiling has been torn out. All right. The upper cabinets have been ripped off the wall. But look how black just above the stove that wall is. Look how black the, the door on that fridge is. Okay. That's amazing. Now, at the bottom of the fridge, that's the evidence of what they teach you in school, right? If you have a fire, get on your hands and knees and walk and crawl underneath the smoke. Literally, that's air you can breathe. But the top half, that smoke and that heat, it's just sitting there billowing on the ceiling. And what they do when they get a situation like this, the first thing they'll do, a lot of times the fire department, they'll walk in and they'll rip the cabinets off. They'll open walls. They'll open the ceiling because they've got to identify if that, that fire is traveling. So the first thing they'll do is put out the flame. They bring in the hoses to do that. So you're soaking your house with water. Then they pull the ceilings down to make sure that it's not hiding in a ceiling cavity. They open walls to make sure it didn't get in behind the walls. They do all this kind of stuff. And then what you're left with is basically a lot of smoke damage and a lot of water damage. All right. The way that you deal with that is you rip everything back to the frame and you start over because you're Plumbing has been compromised, potentially. Your electrical is compromised for sure. And so there's really nothing left there after a little bit of smoke. It just has to be removed back to the studs. So whether it's a big fire or a little fire, if it's just a little fire that burns for five minutes and it's isolated in one corner, almost everything in that kitchen is going to get removed or replaced anyway if you have insurance. All right? They're not in the business of trying to save things because inevitably the smell of that smoke gets in every nook and cranny and you can't get it out. Now, there's different kinds of insurance, blah, blah, blah. The point is this. A little fire, a big fire, again, it's the same thing. They're going to be ripping your kitchen apart and starting over. So don't risk your life trying to change the end result. Trying to uh, respond to a crisis like that to, say, to, to change the outcome, it's, it's not a good plan. It's not a good investment, all right? It's like seeing a stampede and then getting in the way going, oh, way, guys, don't come this way. That's kind of what you're doing, all right? It's going to happen regardless of your effort. Get out of the way, all right, and let the restoration side of things take care of things. Now, yes, ozone is actually still used. It's massively effective. They even use that when you're selling used cars now. They ozone cars to get rid of the previous owner's cigarette smoke smell. Yeah, I know. It's brilliant. Um, ba -ba -bum -bum. Okay, so fire. First thing we do is we check the structure integrity. Similar with heavy wind damage, right? Um, we would go in and we would make sure we put a weatherproofing system in, the, in, in place again. If the roof is ripped up or whatever, it's just tarps. That's the response side of things, Okay. If you're dealing with flooding, the response is wait till the water goes down and then rip everything else that's out of the house that's too wet to be able to be saved. Because the idea is, because we build almost everything with wood, if you leave it wet and the wood is wet and the drywall is wet, then mold grows. Because the mold is in the wood, right? That's where it comes from. It doesn't come from the water. It comes from the wood. It's, it's in the dirt in the forest. The trees absorb the mold when they're getting the nutrients out of the ground and the mold is in the tree. And as long as the tree is healthy and it maintains its own relative humidity, the mold's under control. We cut the lumber, we put it in the house, we maintain humidity, mold's under control, it doesn't grow. So as soon as you introduce the water and then you introduce a food source like drywall, wow, watch out, it grows like a weed, right? So the, the goal with the response is get rid of all the materials that are soaking wet. Flooring, subflooring, drywall, okay? And then everything gets treated with fans and dehumidifiers to dry it all out that's really kind of simple <laughs> yes actually i'm looking at the, the chat here ozone is dangerous um that's why they have ozone rooms right they'll have closed environments where they introduce the ozone because where ozone is oxygen isn't <laughs> so that's the thing that's how that works now um i just wanted to go through this uh, if you got heavy rain, that can have a flood. If you have heavy wind, you could have a, you can have an emergency there as well. 
Yeah, obviously fire, sewer backup. Now let's deal with that. We've talked about the response. Let's talk about the restoration. Because this is actually where you as a homeowner have an opportunity to make some money, right? We've talked before about uh, the cost versus value report when you're doing a renovation, the kind of return on investment. The, we talked there and we talked about, hey, how much money it actually takes to run a business nowadays, right? And what the cost of materials are on a job. Usually the cost of materials on a job are around 20%. Especially with building materials, it can be even less than that. Like your basic stuff, right? Like just flooring, drywall, and trim. You're looking at 15 20%. So once you've got your response and they've cleaned it up and they've given you the, your house back and said, here's your home, it's half empty. Our team is now done. They bring in the second wave. Your insurance company will send in an estimator. The response, the restoration company will send in somebody who's an estimator. And they'll all get together to work, put together a scope of work. Total linear feet, total square footage, all this kind of stuff. Yeah. Sorry, Matt. I saw you had your... Okay. <laughs> well, working the bugs out of our system here. They're going to come together and they're going to put a document together with a scope of work. And they're going to say, here you go, uh, Mr. or Mr. Homeowner. This is the cost for us to fix your house and put it back the way it was. All right. Now, that is 15% building material, 85% cost of doing business. And if you look at the last page of the document, they actually have on their profit 10%. It's added in. It's like, aside from all the cost of doing the job, I'm also going to make an extra 10% because they have a management structure that's more expensive than construction. There's a lot of people involved in that, all right? So what happens is that in a lot of cases, they'll give you this opportunity. They'll say, you can agree to this, and you have two choices. You can sign the dotted line, and they'll start sending in the crews, and they'll do a restoration process. And traditionally, insurance companies have what they call a one-year mandate. Think about this. One year to finish fixing your house up. And it's about the same if it burns to the ground or you have a kitchen fire. They give you a whole year. So you don't even have a position where you can argue with them if it's not done 10 months later because the year isn't up. That's amazing. Or option two, they'll cut you a check for the cost of that project minus that 10% profit margin. All right? And they do that on purpose so that if you want to cash out, they're actually spending less money than if they do the work themselves. Now, that's on the insurance company side. The restoration company is more than happy to get the contract. If you take the money and fix it yourself using, I don't know, some guy on YouTube, he makes videos, teach you how to frame and drywall and put in your flooring. Are you serious? 85% margin? Not bad, eh? You could actually fix up your house and then go buy yourself that brand new mixed fuel stove and nice fridge and everything else. <laughs> uh, now, um, doing flood restoration is a little tricky, okay? It's a little bit different because they cut your walls in half and everything on that perimeter is now a butt joint, so it takes a lot of work. Um, you might find that sometimes it's easier to just to remove the old wall entirely I don't know why restoration companies are happy with cutting walls in half. It's because they don't have to affect the ceiling in a lot of cases, and it reduces the scope of work. But it's really tricky to get a nice finish. And I'll be honest with you, the standard of quality that they're going with when they're reinstating all of those materials is not at the highest level. All right. Let's just put it that way. It's, it's on the lower level of skills and, and abilities. All right. And you may not be very pleased with the outcome. Now, um, Matt, how are we doing here with the chat? <laughs> I type slower than Jeff talks. Yeah, I can get at it, eh? My goodness. Now, does anybody got any questions in the chat there? I want to just open this up. If you've got questions about have you suffered a fire or a flood? Are you in the midst of something right now? Um, is there anything going on in your world where you live that you need assistance with? Then feel free. Yeah, how to restore a crooked ceiling edge. Right? 
Uh, sometimes the best way to fix something that's crooked is to add another corner that's straight. It's really that simple. They make uh, corner beads that have got metal edging on the inside. So you can actually mud in a nice new fresh corner and then just retape with a four inch knife on both sides. Not a big deal. Um, wow. Are we going back looking for questions there, Matt? All right. Let's see. Okay, let's just go back to the more recent stuff. Now that we're here and I'm paying attention. Okay. Yeah, your bathroom flooded. All right, Linda. Bathroom floods are, are different. We're not going to call that a disaster, but when you do get a bathroom flood, it can give you a lot of the same kind of results. Um, okay. What's the best way to track the source of a leak in a ceiling? Open up the ceiling. The other thing you can do is you can actually take your uh, big six foot level, put it on the ceiling and see what the slope is. A lot of cases where your, your construction is dealing with dimensional lumber and dimensional lumber all has a bit of a sag to it. And so water will always follow the path of least resistance. So if your ceiling has a slope, the water has a slope. So it would come out at a light in the middle of the room, for instance, but it's coming from one of the four walls. The most likely is the exterior wall, okay, where water got in um, on, from the roof and it got on the wrong side of the vapor barrier, usually from like ice damming and that sort of thing. But the only way you can track water is if you actually open it up. And you can actually see the water lines on the wood and the drywall and everything else. Would you move a support pole to another area? What happened there? Wow. Okay. Would you move a sport pole from to another area to make room? If so, how would you do it? Okay, that's not a disaster question, but uh, call a structural engineer because that pole's there for a reason. It's holding your house up. And yes, you can definitely move them and change the engineering, but you need to have uh, drawings and a permit. Um, is that a picture, an actual wood piece? This thing. That's just a picture. It's kind of cool. I like it. My wife got it for me. All right. Uh, have you seen a big increase in building material during COVID? Oh, you mean the cost probably? Yeah, it's nuts. Uh, we actually filmed a video just the other day. It's going to come out in a few weeks. I showed everybody in this video and I did it in my living room. Bear with me. But I showed you how to frame and finish your basement using steel studs because they're half the price of wood right now. Right? Um, there's nothing really wrong with using steel in the basement. Uh, just don't do it right up against the concrete. And, of course, you've got to be a little more careful. It takes a couple different tools. There's some different technologies involved with that and in, in, in the applications. So I went through all of that information in the video, and it'll come out soon. But if you're planning a basement renovation, uh, don't be intimidated by the cost of wood. You can always go to metal. It's not as difficult as you'd think. All right. Uh, in your basement, Nathan asked a question. When it rains hard, we get water down in the basement. We have a sump pump, but should I do any work on the side of the house to try to get the water away from the house? Yes, Nathan, that is what we call grading. It means if this is your house, this is your ground, you need it to look like this, okay? Um, for every foot away from the house the water travels, all right, it's like a foot away is a foot down. So if your basement is, you know, six feet buried or five feet buried, you need to get the water five feet away from the house to keep it away. Otherwise, you're in trouble. So grading your property is important. I actually tell people to check your grading twice a year because it only takes five minutes. <laughs> and if, if you're going to be going around the house and turning off your faucets for the winter and then turning them back on in the spring, great time to check your grading, all right? Make sure that everything is tickety-boo because uh, if you aren't paying attention to that on a regular basis, by the time you realize you have a problem, it's already in your basement. But yeah, uh, it's, it's one of those things, you know, a little bit of dirt goes a long way. Uh, is metal considered worse or better than wood framing? Upside to wood or metal framing. Okay, so here we go. We're going to get into this conversation. Let's do it. People ask me, do you prefer metal or wood? I like wood because I like the smell of wood when I cut it. That's about the only reason I like to work with wood. It's, for me, it's emotional. It, it reminds me of being a kid working on the houses with my parents. It was fun. All right? So to me, it's like, love the smell of napalm in the morning kind of thing for me, right? That's what it is. So the reality is there's no difference as far as wood or metal. 
other than price. So as the market changes and fluctuates, you might find that one is better than the other. There are advantages to wood over metal, though. And that comes to um, when you're doing your wiring and your plumbing. It's really easy to run all that stuff. When you switch over to metal, you're now doing different things. And I guess you can get accustomed to it. Plumbing is my only thing. I hate doing plumbing around metal studs. The advantage that metal has over wood, though, is that it's always straight. Yeah, you don't get any of those warp walls. And if you want to use metal studs and you're going to be installing drywall, um, you have to buy a drywall screw gun. No buts about it. You can't install drywall on metal studs with any other kind of drill on the market. I don't care what anybody says. Spend the 80 bucks, get the screw gun, or you're going to go drive yourself nuts. No, no adapter on any other kind of drill for dimpling works either, okay? Whatever it is, it's a combination of the type of screw and the certain speed and the way it has a depth setter. I'm telling you right now, I, I, in that video, I tried a few different techniques. It'll drive you nuts, okay? When you're working with wood, you can use just about any, you can use a screwdriver and put your drywall on when you're working with wood. But with metal, you need the right tool. All right. Jake is asking me, he's got a ceiling fan that drips water twice a year when it's super heavy rain okay <laughs> so since it only happens when it really rains right all that means is that you've got something going on with your roof and the water's getting into your house you have a weak spot uh it's probably worth inspecting where that is and fixing it because it's probably just caulking along some flashing somewhere that's a five dollar five minute fix the only thing there is you got to risk your life to get up on a ladder <laughs> so that's that's really the only problem um, how do you mount a TV and hide the wires on a brick wood burning fireplace? You don't. <laughs> In behind the brick is your fireplace. <laughs> wow. Um, there is actually some plastic track that you can buy. That'll be a little bit less ugly than just wires dangling. And you can take uh, tie wraps and put all your wires together in a nice tight bundle. And then you can install a plastic track, put in your wires, and then put over a decorative cap. And at least then it's tidy. But don't be drilling a hole in the facade of your fireplace to run your TV cable down there. Bad plan. Um, yeah. Okay. Oh, Stacy Perez loves our content. Cheers, Stacy. Perez, I'm going to guarantee you're going to love our new Spanish channel. Just, just a guess. This guy's voice, I'm telling you, he sounds so amazing. I sound like Kermit the Frog, but this guy that's doing the work for us, he has an amazing voice. Um, okay, Tombstone's asking me about retaining wall for an outdoor fence. Any advice? Yeah, you know what? Questions like that really, really get my, I mean, what do I do with that? Okay, so you're going to put a retaining wall up and a fence on the retaining wall? The advice I would have is make sure that you're installing your retaining wall with really good quality adhesives, all right, and that you actually have a good bond. Because if you're attaching your fence to the retaining wall, then you're going to be drilling holes in your stone. And now that retaining wall isn't just holding back dirt that's sitting there. It's got to be the structural support for the wind load against the fence. You might even want to get that engineered. Um, my advice would be to actually build a fence behind the retaining wall so you can actually bury it in the ground, okay? But uh, I get the idea. All right, let's see what we got here. What's wrong with Kermit the Frog? <laughs> well, nothing if you're into, like, cute little songs by the pond. All right, Matt, get me back up to speed here. All right, we're taking some more questions here from the general audience. Let's go, guys. Subscribers, Home Renovation Nation. Who's the best hire to fix drainage issues around the foundation yard, etc.? cetera? Um, <laughs> your kids. <laughs> it's just a shovel. Now, unless you've got like a massive issue with slope and um, you don't have any slope, you don't have good drainage, then you want to call a landscaper in, okay? Be careful, though, because usually the solution for drainage around a house with bad slope is just to dig a trench and put some gravel in it and lay the weeping tile in that ditch on an angle and then cover it up with dirt or gravel again. 
they might want to try to sell you the whole elaborate system that's just not necessary. It's called a French drain, and it's called that because it was um, engineered and designed by Mr. French back a long time ago, and he saw the need to move water away from a house, and that was a really good idea because we still are dealing with water in our homes today because we don't think it's an issue as long as it's on the other side of our window. Unbelievable. All right, so not Chauncey. Can I replace a bathtub with a walk-in shower? Is there any constitutional disadvantages of no longer having a bathtub in that area? Well, I don't know why the government would care, but, you know, hey. Um, I would say the only issue is resale of your home. There is still a desire in real estate world for agents to say you've got to have at least one tub in the house. So if it's your only bathroom, you it's not that it's not saleable, but the market of people that don't want a tub is a lot smaller than the people that want a tub. All right, so it's an investment issue. If you only have one bathroom, do what you want to do, but you're selling to a smaller market. Um, but if it's a really nice walk-in shower and you got a bench and it bells and whistles, it could also just as easily sell it to that smaller market. So keep that in mind. All right, Matt, give me something here, man. Highlight something so I know what to talk about. <laughs> Uh, ba -bum. stop. Is it okay to vent bathroom exhaust directly into the soffit? And what vent cap would you recommend? All right, I can't give you a brand for a vent cap, but I'll give you this. Um, there are soffit vents that are spring loaded, okay, so that when the exhaust is being pushed out, they open up to let the air out. And when it's not pushing, they snap back in place so that the window side isn't blowing into the house. And they're really effective. The challenge here is. If you're in a four season climate and you get winter time, are you venting out into an area that the wind is, is blowing directly at? So if this is the wall of your house and the wind's coming straight at it and you have a soffit overhang here and your vents pouring, blowing water out of the wall, the wind will blow it right back in the building. It'll freeze on the building. Okay. And what you'll end up doing is starting an ice dam in your soffit. And that'll walk right back into the house. And the reason I know this is because I actually had to redo somebody's bedroom and ceiling and the next bathroom because of an ice dam that thawed in the spring. Because the ice was being, the wind and that moisture was being blown into the attic caused a huge ice dam. And they didn't see it for months. So, yes, it works. Make sure that if you do it, it's not on the wind-facing side. Okay, run it to the other soffit. That's all I'm saying. And bathroom fans can go 20 feet, so feel free to hit a gable. Shower was leaking. Previous owner didn't know. Sure. Base plate of framing is destroyed. Yeah. How do I know how much to tear apart to fix? How do I fix the base plate? Okay. So if the shower's leaking and the wall gets wet and the wall structure is rotting, just cut it out with a reciprocator saw. Okay. Most interior walls are not structural. If it's not made of two by six, you've got nothing to be concerned about. As long as it's two by four construction, it's a non-load bearing interior wall. So that makes life simple. Cheers, diamond bricks. Appreciate the love. All right. So that's really, not, that's that thing. Um, top and bottom plates holding studs. The reason we have top and bottom plates is so we have something to nail the studs to, not because it's holding up your house. All right. So there's two rules. Two by fours, if it's a supporting wall, it has to have a stud every 12 inches, not 16. So if you measure 16 out, you know it's not structural. Two by six walls on an interior wall are almost always structural, unless it's just to create a mechanical space, which is a thick enough wall to run all the stuff. If you're not exactly sure, then I would consider joining our membership program. You can send me pictures and I can help you diagnose that. And ladies and gentlemen, for five bucks to send in a picture, get an answer on a question like that instead of hiring an engineer or construction firm to come out and take a look. Because if you ask a construction guy to your, comp to your house to ask a question about your structure, I'll guarantee you he's going to find a reason to hire him. <laughs> right? If you just need a, an answer like that, you can send me a picture and you can do the work yourself. Because a reciprocator saw is a lovely surgical tool and you can cut things out and replace it and fix it up in no time. I'm actually planning on doing a video real soon. I have no need for this, so I'm going to build a floor package and a wall package and show you guys how to open up your floor and fix crooked and warped joists, fix crooked and warped walls, how to cut out and restore things. 
We're going to go through whole scenarios there about how to deal with your lumber so you can straighten that stuff out and have better results when you finish. Um, okay, Matt, what do you got for me? Right there, Chris. Chris is asking me, how difficult is it to put a false wall in my bedroom to give me extra clothing storage? Ah, oh, I see what you're saying. Now, if you just want to put like a, like a, just a wall standing there, it can be difficult because it's not attached to anything. If you go right floor to ceiling, it's a piece of cake. All you got to do is buy yourself a $12 stud finder. Mark the locations where there's actually lumber so that you can frame a wall, put it in place, and then use some shims and screws to tighten it all down. Two screws in the top, two screws in the bottom on every six or eight foot wall is about all you're going to need for temporary, okay? And then it can be exactly that temporary because you only have a couple of holes if you ever want to tear it out again. Uh, bad dog. <laughs> Love this. Oh, you guys are awesome. Oh, can you add a shower to a jacuzzi tub? That's an interesting question. <sighs> um, if your jacuzzi tub has an integrated tile flange, and what I mean by that is the side of the tub also has that thin lip, it's the same as any other tub. So yes, it can be, it can be double duty. Okay, you can make it into a shower as well. If it's a jacuzzi tub that's designed to be dropped onto a surface, okay, and it doesn't have the integrated tile flange, and you want to frame your walls up to that edge and then tile down to it, you're going to run into trouble. Water will get in behind there. I'll guarantee it. Um, the acrylic of the tub actually is like a magnet to the water because it's similar substances, right? So even if you get down to that crack and you're diverting water, it'll grow through grout lines it'll, and it'll start crawling its way around. It'll find wood and then it's like a sponge, like a siphon. So if you don't have an integrated tile flange, they sell a kit. You can add one with silicone. I'm not a fan. So if you have a current jacuzzi tub and you're trying to retrofit, I say don't. If you want to buy a jacuzzi tub with an integrated tile flange and then make a shower as well, then yes, by all means, go ahead. Welcome to Money in the Bank. Who is that? Brian Johnson. Brian Johnson. Cheers, man. Welcome to the membership plan. Okay, we got a question here. Can I add a ground to a light switch? No ground wire. Uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, usually pretty easy if you just run a brand new wire to your switch. That's about the only way to add a ground wire is to bring a new wire in. You got a ground wire means the wire is following a system of wiring that actually goes out and is buried in the ground. Okay? There's actually a metal plate that's in the ground outside your house. Uh, anyone want, okay, people want to know, was this going to be available after to review? The answer is yes. It'll be posted on our site under the live show category. I don't think we're going to do any editing on this. So if there's information in there from the beginning that you're looking for, it'll be available on the site forever and ever. Amen. Is there an alternative way to build a shower without tiling? Yes. Definitely. Okay. Um, there are all kinds of acrylic wall panels um, and other types of systems like that where they sell wall panel systems that aren't tile. And they're just water diversion systems. They're done with silicone. And we're actually going to be doing a video of that in the near future. Probably in the same video after I'm done messing around with all that structure, I'll build a quick little bathroom in there as well just to show you guys how to do all that sort of thing. Um, okay. Well, you know what? It is a quarter to 12. I know the members have been real patient. I think it's going to be time. Let's see if we can get that phone going. Guys, if you're members and you want to call in, yeah, the phones are going to be on in just a few minutes. But what I want you to do is I want you to go to the email, the member's email, send us some current pictures that we can be related to. We'll bring them up on the computer so that people at home can see what's going on in your world. And if you're a member and you just want to say thanks and show us what you've done, then send in those pictures too. All right? It'd be nice to talk to you and say, hey, and uh, love to see what you guys are doing. Ah, Thomas is saying it's the first show since joining. That's cool, Thomas. We're going to try to do more and more of these, but like I said, I am up to my eyebrows in renovation work at that farmhouse, trying to get it done before winter. Man, once we get over that hump, we're going to be available a lot more, so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, Tony's saying that he bought a Max Acrylic Aerojet tub with tiling flange. Like, no, best backing for the shower walls in the alcove. 
I read that quick because sometimes the screens just disappear on me. Okay. Cheers, Carson. Appreciate the love, man. Cheers. Two minutes? Ten minutes? All right. Ten minutes we're going to do the phone. Not sure why, but apparently it's not quite done charging yet, maybe. Um, as far as the backing? Yes. Okay. Um, we are going to be going live in ten minutes. Give you guys a chance to get all those pictures in. As far as tubs are concerned, the best system for tub surround, okay, and I'm going to do this in order, engineered um, polystyrene boards like Weedy or Schluter, then cement board with a waterproofing roll-on membrane, then drywall with a Schluter membrane, and then ultimately no membrane at all and just drywall. Yes, it still works, but you have to use a grout with a sealer so that water doesn't get behind the tile, all right? There's a lot of different ways to do it, um, a lot of different advantages and disadvantages, mostly related to price. At the end of the day, you get what you pay for, and as a homeowner, you can use the most expensive system and actually get a lot of value out of it. Welcome to Money in the Bank as far as membership program. Mario, cheers, my friend. Hey, if you're here now, why don't you send us a quick picture of the project you're working on, see if we can get you on the phone later. All right. Where do we find the number to call in? Well, Timothy, uh, if you're a member, and you are, because I see a little house icon, you got to go to the home page, go to the community tab, all right? I did a member post there today. It'll be the most recent thing in that community tab, and it'll have the phone number on there for you. And I can't give the phone number out like a radio show because I don't want the whole world calling, or it'd be too hard to get the members on the phone. So that is the system. Mm, Carson Blair sent in a super chat here, and he's got a question. So... Not sure how to finish drywall corner bead and curdy board in the shower. They will both meet up on the corner tile edge too. Okay, so treat curdy board like drywall. All right, and now if it's a corner, you're going to want to use the metal corner bead and use nails or screws to install it. And then on the shower side, bring your tile right up to the edge of that bead and then use a metal edging on your tile. Okay. And then you are going to have a nice finished clean look. And on the other side, you can fill with a drywall compound and paint it in. Now, before you tile, you should be finished all your drywall compound work, all your priming and painting. I always tell people, if you're tiling up against a finished room, you can have a finished look. But if you're going to tile first and try to mud and paint later, you better have one heck of a steady hand. All right, Tiffany Kepler, welcome to the membership program. Cheers to you. Again, if you have a question, and since you're here in the chat, maybe you want to send in a pic and then uh, give us a quick call. In a few minutes, we'll let you know when the phone lines are open. Diamond Bricks is asking me, how do I repair small cracks around the surround, bathtub, and shower? I'm going to assume your cracks are tile-related. <laughs> Generally speaking, when you get cracks in your tile in a shower, it's because moisture's been getting in behind there, and things are starting to swell, and you have movement. Wow. All right. That means that your substrate is wet. So fixing that crack, it's tough. You can use silicone, white silicone if you've got white grout. Okay. Just a little dab will do, though. And that'll extend the life of what you're doing in that shower. Consider even cleaning it and then adding a sealer on the grout. 95% of grout jobs in North America do not get grout sealer, not even in bathrooms. All right. If you understand that, you'll know that your problem is the fact that they use cheap grout when they're building things. There is no building code standard for bathrooms with, in respect to the grout that you use. Common sense would say if it's in a bathroom, you can make the tile and the grout sealed so water doesn't get behind it would be a good thing. But there is no industry standard or government standard, so people don't do it. They cheap out because they can put in $4 worth of grout instead of 20 times thousands of houses a year, it's actual royal money. So they are cheap. So we all suffer the consequence because our bathroom lasts half as long as it would if they'd spent another $14. Gotta love it, but that's the system, all right? You can fix with silicone, you can seal up your grout and extend the life of it, but know this, your walls are shot and you're gonna need to rip them out and start over again. Now, Matt, I can't see the chat right now. There we go, thank you, sir. Okay. <laughs> Roger had the same question as Mario. Where do we send photos? Members email. Gentlemen, community post. Go to the home page on YouTube and you will find it. 
All right. Kenneth is asking, good to have this live chat. Can I change out a regular toilet to a floating toilet? Okay, Ken, I am not familiar with the concept of a floating toilet. If you mean a toilet that's hung on the wall, so it has the appearance of floating, yes, you can change that out. Yes, you need a building permit because you're now changing your drain and venting scenario. And there's a lot of consideration because now you're moving your plumbing into your wall. So it has to be an interior wall. It also has to be thick enough to endure that plumbing. So it might be a bigger renovation than you originally think because most interior walls are two by four and you can't really do the plumbing for a toilet in a two by four wall. Oh, maybe you get lucky. Um, yeah, that's a tough one. Diamond Bricks is saying I have drywall. Can we go back up to Diamond Bricks last chat? Yeah, it's the drywall is swollen up because it's soaking wet. You know? Wow. Diamond Bricks, I'm going to consider you try joining the membership program because uh, I know I, I appreciate the super chats and all, but you just got two months of free membership right there. <laughs> just a thought. All right. No problem. Um Let's go back to the fresh stuff at the bottom here. How do I become a member? All right, let's talk about that. Depending on the device that you're on, you'll have different opportunities. If you're on your phone and you're watching a video, sometimes there in the top right corner of the screen, you're gonna see other video options, but at the top, there should be a little tab there where you can push a button and say yes to become a member. It's called join. Um, if you're on a home computer, then You'll see the join button on the screen just underneath the video. If you go to the home page, you'll be able to see something there. And if you go into the description of any video by hitting show more underneath the title, it opens up the video description. And in those video descriptions, you'll see links that you can join. You can shop on our Amazon page. You can see other videos and other subject matter. And so everybody needs to understand that in the show more is actually what we call the video description, okay? So feel free to check all that out and becoming a member is not that tricky. And let's get into some questions. <laughs> Tapcon issues tend to shear in concrete. Yes, I am pre-drilling. Well, then you've got the size wrong, right? If you're gonna Tapcon and your screws are breaking, you've got the wrong size bit to drill the hole with. Pre-drilling isn't the, the issue there. It's pre-drilling the right size hole. Tapcon doesn't work like wood where you pre-drill a small hole and put in a big screw to keep it from splitting. Tapcon in concrete requires the hole to be big enough to accept the screw. And you want to leave enough dust in that hole that it creates bond. If you've cleaned out all the dust and you have the reverse action with changing your bit that it doesn't hold the screw, just go grab yourself a little bit of wire, stick it on the hole, with, and then put the screw in and you'll be fine. All right, can you put PVA in grout to make it waterproof? <sighs> I'm going to suggest that if you want waterproof grout, you got two options. Buy the grout that has the sealer in it already, okay? And if we're dealing with MapEye products, which I recommend, Caracolor is no sealer. UltraColor has a sealer. We just finished filming a video about the difference in the two because we've had people who are using the UltraColor with the sealer. Understand it's not the only change, okay? Grout with sealer, the Ultra Color, is not the same product with the sealer. It's a completely different product. It operates differently. It reacts differently to temperature and time. And if you just go and make that decision, I'm going to use Ultra Color as a DIYer without grout experience, you're in for one hell of a ride when it comes to wiping and cleaning that off and finishing your bathroom. I've had people comment to me before, oh, I use this stuff instead and... By the time I was done applying it, it was rock hard and I couldn't wipe it off. Yep, I didn't recommend it. And if you don't read the instructions on a product that you know nothing about, this is what happens. So if you want a sealed grout, buy the simple stuff, buy the carrot color, and then apply a sealer after the fact. Okay, if you're comfortable with grouting, then go to a carrot color or so the ultra color, but read the package first. You might want to mix half a bag at a time right? It's all about managing your time and expectation. In a hotter room, the warmer the room is, okay, the faster that grout's going to set. It's a chemical reaction, and chemical reactions respond to two things. Minerals in the water, so if you're in the country, it's going to dry faster, and it reacts to heat. So if you use cold water, 
you'll be much better off. But if you're using warm water to mix that grout, man, it's going to be set by the time you put it on the wall. <laughs> so be warned and be careful. Now, since only a couple thousand people are ever going to see this video, most likely, I made a video on that so we can demonstrate all that and save the whole world. All right, let's move on. Uh, you got two different levels in your house, but you want to bring the floors up to be even and the ceilings. But the rafters, where did that go? No? Yeah, that's tricky. We'll deal with that another time. Uh, Peter Cushman, member here on the ch on the channel, has asked me. I'd like to know with the high prices lumber today, what are the alternative construction methods available to build a shed? So I am on a limited budget. Okay. Ah. If you are on a limited budget and you want to build a shed, you can cut a couple of corners, but it's going to affect the quality of the shed. First of all, um, if it's less than ten by ten by ten. There's no building code where I live. You can do whatever you want. You can frame it two feet on center instead of every 16 inches, right? You can put on a corrugated uh, plastic roof uh, instead of, you know, uh, asponite and roofing shingles or some other system. You, what other ways to cut costs on a shed? You can wrap your shed in vinyl siding. That can be a cost savings. But at the end of the day, um, there's only so much you can do. If, if the wood is too expensive to do the job right the first time, I'm going to say wait another year because wood is not getting any cheaper. What not for a long time. What about your steel studs? You plow the outside and then you, just, you spray on an oil paint for water resistance. Uh, yeah. Yeah, the system that we did in that video, Matt, though, with the, um, those exterior wall panels is probably the most cost-effective way to build a shed. Because you get the added effect of the stability against the wind from the, the structure moving and having a finished painted surface. So it's tough. Yeah, you know what? If, you, if, you, if cost is a factor, um, uh, frame it and put on a blue tarp. Wait till, wait till things get more, more economical. That's hard to say. Yeah, that, oh my goodness. Tough, tough, tough. Um, how important is it to level a floor before tiling? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you see, here you are. Well, Ryan, you're asking a question, how do I level a floor in an old house that's already sagged and been affected? If, you're, if your level is out two inches, then the answer is don't level your floor. I know. That's almost offensive, isn't it? You can install your floor flush and... All your tiles can meet together without, a, uh, without ridges and lippage and still follow the contour of a floor, okay? And in a lot of cases, that's actually necessary. Unless you were willing to level it and have that huge transition, then you're going to want to get into buying a piece of granite or marble or something and using a sill at the door. That's the only way you can do that. Um, okay, we'll, we'll do this. We've got a super chat here. What is the minimum number of coats of paint to hide the drywall gaps and holes that are currently visible okay so we don't use paint to fill gaps and cracks we use a drywall compound or a spackling once you've got that on you need to use a primer for that compound and then it's usually two coats of paint to finish if you're trying to fix it with just paint then it really becomes a question of how big is the hole in the gap and how much paint did you want on your wall. Um, but yeah, it's probably possible, depending on how bad the damage is, especially if you're using bare. That stuff's thick. <laughs> bare paint will fill the cracks in your concrete. No problem. All right. Uh, keep hammering. Cheers, Dwayne. Appreciate that, man. Keep hammering. Yeah, that's actually... Maybe you should put that on a T-shirt, eh? Yeah, that's, that's fun. We should get that on a t-shirt, Matt. Keep hammering. Hey, here's a quick quick question for the whole world. Do you guys care that I don't sell t-shirts? <laughs> we haven't done it yet. We haven't had any good excuses to do it yet. I Until I can find a way to do that cost-effective and, and give you something that you're interested in. So if you have questions and stuff like that about merch, my God. Or if you want to do it for 
or if you want to do it for us, I'm not a merch guy, but if anybody out there, you know, wants the rights to sell merch with my name on it, then by all means, if you can be creative and come up with some good stuff, people will actually buy and go, all right, go right ahead, just contact us, let us know. All right. Um, wow. So we got a super chat here. Can I use linoleum in my bathroom? Do I have to put anything under before? Yes, if you're going to use a sheet good like linoleum, you need a quarter inch plywood on top of whatever substrate you have because linoleum is really susceptible to what we call translation. And that is every bump and every gap will actually show through the linoleum over time because where you step, you'll actually force that into the, the nooks and the grooves or over the bumps. So what we do is we install a quarter inch plywood. We, we install it nice and tight, nice and smooth. And then you can just lay your linoleum on top, whether it's a, a loose lay or a glue down. It's the same process. Just quarter inch with staples, um, and that works out great. Okay, Matt, I feel like I missed something. Can you go up just a bit? Yeah, Alan. Yeah, there we go. So Alan joined the membership program. Welcome to Money in the Bank. <laughs> That's awesome. Cheers, Alan. Welcome aboard. All right. See, it can't be that hard. People are joining membership all the time. Any tips and tricks on how to cut tile to not get little chips? <whistles> yeah, actually, I just filmed that video. Uh, I just filmed a video how to cut tile. We did glass and ceramic and porcelain, exterior one inch thick porcelain, and we used tile cutters and tile scissors called nippers, and a wet saw and a grinder and a scratch tool. And I showed you all the different techniques and tools for that. That video is going to be out a little bit. Probably about a month. Uh, um, but go until the battery runs out. Yeah, we'll go until the battery runs out. That works. Why not? Sure. Okay, so we're gonna just call that. Say um, phone lines are open. All right. Where did Matt go? He's plugging in the phone line, probably. Yeah, there we go. As soon as he plugs it in, eh? That didn't take long. All right, I'm gonna go more like this. Now I gotta remember how to do this. Speaker to the mic. Talk, and then I got speaker. Hello, you're on the air with Jeff. Hi Jeff, my name is Aaron. I live in Utah, in the United States. Okay, wait a second. One second, Aaron. What am I doing? Uh, this is the big silver button. You just go up or down for going. Okay. Yep. Okay. Hi Aaron. Let's try that again. Hey, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Yeah. All right. <laughs> awesome. So I sent in an email a little bit earlier this morning. Yep. Aaron sent in an email this morning, Matt. If you can pull that up. I believe the subject line was water damage on a window. Yeah. Aaron Ellis, water damage, yes. Yes. Okay. Well, I recently, just back in June, moved into this house. Yep. And the previous owner left this window broken for a good while. Okay. So... Uh, it leaked inside, but the thing is, most of the basement windows have similar water damage around them. Yeah. And you haven't quite done a video explaining how to replace water damage uh, or replace windows that are already existing. So I want to try to tackle this. I just don't know how to do it with the vinyl siding that's already there. Okay. Matt, can I get so that picture on my how screen, do I please? about replacing or fixing All right. a like this? I did see a few other chats with similar questions. Yeah, yeah. So, Aaron, here's what I'm looking at. Um, do you see then that picture that's on the screen right now? Is there one with the plug? Uh, it's not on the screen right now, but it was just a second ago. Okay. Do we have that up now? Yeah, we have a bit of a time delay here, so give me a couple seconds. Uh, so. What I'm looking at here, Aaron, is you've got a vinyl siding job. Um, it's a little bit on the creative side. The electrical plug looks yeah. like it's got room there for water to get in. There's a gap in the caulking on the actual window, right in the middle of the window. Yep. Right? There's probably cracking along the vinyl all along that caulking. Just by the looks of it, it, it needs another caulking job. It looks to me like whoever installed that, um, the window was probably flush with whatever pre-existing materials around that house. And then they added siding after the fact. So now that you can't see how that window is sealed to the, the original structure, you've got to make sure that you seal your window to that siding. And so I would want a nice healthy bead onto that siding and then be able to judge whether or not it has let go. Because the smallest crack lets in a lot of water. 
I had a client who had a hole that size underneath a door flashing, and it actually um, rotted out the rim joist. An ant colony moved in, and the subsequent cause of that damage, that was a structural load, it actually, the ceiling in the kitchen caved in. A one inch gap in the caulking can destroy your entire home. I know it's crazy, but it's true. <laughs> when we open uh, that up, I can actually, I'm sorry, go ahead. There's another window actually that it looks like there was either termite or ant damage as well. Yeah. And, 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 uh, and what, so what's, I'm sure that's what's happened. What's going on there is when the water gets in the wood and it doesn't have any access to the air, in that, like in that situation, it doesn't dry out. It takes so long to dry out that during like a fall season or something like that where the water is constantly being integrated, the, the wood rots so fast. And then when the ants find that kind of wood, they're like, perfect. perfect. It's a vacation paradise, yeah. right? So, yeah, that's well, tricky. There is another picture of the inside. Uh, and I'm, it's just, it's terrible. So I, I feel like I need to replace most of the stuff there. I'm looking at that now. You know, where do you yeah, so what you've got there is you've actually got mold, which means that the drywall is in contact with the wood and they're both staying wet. So there's a couple reasons for that. Yeah, it just looks like that whole assembly needs to be looked at all over again. What I'm going to suggest is that if you can take that window out and open up the drywall return right to that drywall corner, and just have a good look and see if the structure is salvageable. And by that I mean, can it hold a screw? If the wood can hold a screw, then you can stain seal that and, and clean off the mold with a little bit of um, microbium or bleach or something. Let it dry, stain seal it with the kills, and you can put in a brand new window. The problem I'm gonna have here is that all around that window, when you put a new one in, I want you to cut back your vinyl siding and buy a new construction window so that you can seal your window to the exterior of your building. And then what you can do with that is you can actually put in aluminum flashing, like a three or four inch picture frame around over top of that. That'll allow you to change the windows without having to do all brand new siding on the whole house. And it'll give you much better water control. Now, that'll only work if the house has a house wrap on it. <laughs> a wrap underneath the vinyl siding that is yeah like there should be a Tyvek or Typar or some sort of house wrap as long as it has a house wrap then you can seal that house wrap to your new window and you'll be fine but if there's no house wrap then there's no way to seal the water from getting in behind and then replacing siding might be the next big project there it, it might be all together yeah right so yeah. really what you want to do is open up that inside of the window and then replace one window or or if you can uninstall the window and just take it out and have a look and see how is your house built find out if there's a house wrap there or cut away the caulking and pull the edge of the vinyl siding off a little bit and have a good look the other thing you can do ah vinyl siding if you do you have you ever seen a vinyl siding removal tool that little red thing i have not but i can google it okay if you buy a vinyl siding removal tool, I just did a video, it's coming up in a couple weeks, but you can actually um, disengage the locking mechanism on your siding and you can lift it up and have a look at what's behind there. Okay. So for less than 10 bucks, you can investigate whether or not your house has a house wrap and then formulate a proper plan to move forward. Okay? okay. And that is money, that's, that's gold. Because then you don't have to order anything twice, you don't run into surprises or questions. If you don't have a house wrap, you know you can't fix that mess without doing the whole facade, right? So in the meantime, just cock the living daylights out of it and uh, try to open up on the inside so you can get rid of all that molding and dry it out. But yeah. if you have a house wrap, you can fix it with new windows only. You're just going to be cutting into your siding so that you can do that, okay? Um, and if you don't have a house wrap, then you know you've got a much bigger project on your hands. window yes and you know how it has that little flange that's supposed to sit on the outside yeah it's actually beneath the vinyl siding and so it looks like they did do a pretty lazy job of just slapping siding on top of stuff so yeah i, I think a lot of people treat siding like it's like lipstick right it's yeah. just something to make the house look pretty and they don't realize it's actually a really important part of the water diversion system 
And if it's not treated with respect, then it can actually do the exact opposite. It can actually introduce water into behind the walls and cause major problems. So, uh, you know, unfortunately, when, like when you go look at a brand new house and you go walk through it and everything else, you're going to be like impressed. It's going to smell right. It's going to look right. And there can be a hundred things wrong with that house. It's that whole, <laughs> it looks pretty. It must be fine. There's this assumption that everything's always built right when it's not. Most cases, there's a lot of corners cut. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate hey, it. Hey, you're welcome. You know, like, and if you open up that siding and you want to send that picture into us, I can uh, definitely be happy to help you out with that and formulate a plan to move right. forward. All right? I will probably do that. Thank you so much. Cheers, Aaron. my man. Take care. Sure. Thanks, Aaron. Bye-bye. Oh, I got to manage that too, don't I? All right. All right. We're going to maybe take a little less time if we can with every person, but we'll... I want to make sure I, I help you properly. Okay. Here we go. Hi. Yep. Hello. You're on the phone with Jeff. Who's this? Yvette. Yvette. Thank you, Yvette. Oh, you sent in some pictures, too. I did. Okay. I sent um, I'm redoing my bathroom. I'm, I don't know if you remember, but I'm the one that um, had the problem getting the screw off. <laughs> yes. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so... Um, I'm doing the rainforest um, shower. I sent a picture of that, yes. and my water lines are coming from the ceiling on okay. the second floor. Sure. And I didn't. How do I convert that to PEX? Is it the same way? Okay. So your water lines. I'm just going to try to pull up the pictures here. Let's take a look at the water lines coming from the ceiling picture, Matt. And is it copper now? Yes. Oh well, the. Shower rod is copper, and then it has a red and a white um, tube. Okay, one second. Matt, can I get the picture of the insulation wall? You keep pulling up the tower here. Uh, I only have three pictures. Can I see them? And I'll tell you which one I want to look at. All the way to the right. Go down all the way to the right. Yeah, that one. Okay. Let's, let's put that picture on the screen for everybody to take a look at. Okay. So the phone call is a little faster than, than what you're going to see on the computer, everybody. But what you're looking at, that actually is PEX. Oh. Your water okay. supply line is actually, it uh, looks like Upanor PEX, which is, um, the, the fittings are actually an expansion fitting. That's what it looks okay. like to me. It looks like the person who installed it actually took the time to put nailing plates on the on the top of the frame so you can't accidentally put a screw through it. They've done a good job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that is PEX. Now, to the best of my knowledge, you can convert that to the do-it-yourself PEX as well. Mm -hmm. Okay? And that is the cut and crimp. Okay? And you shouldn't have okay. any issues. It is going to reduce your water flow a little bit, though. That is a superior... PEX installation system, and it's something we're going to be doing soon. Um, the tools required to do that are probably still a little bit not affordable and not available to rent yet, so that's a professional oh, installation. Okay. But you can still tap into that. It's the same half-inch line, and you can convert mm -hmm. to traditional, well, what I would call a DIY plumbing. So you shouldn't have any problem. The red is actually red to let you know that's the hot, hot and, yeah. and the white is just standard. Okay, so with the rain shower that I have, it has just the twists on it like you have for your shutoff valve. So do I have to get a connector? Okay, yeah. Can I see the back of that rain shower again, Matt? There, right there. Yep. So what that is is that's just a braided faucet line, okay? And mm -hmm. if you were to tell somebody I need a half-inch PEX connection to a three-eighths three braided faucet line, they would get those two fittings for you, okay? But if you go to the store with those pictures and show them the back of that uh, tower, there's very standard connections. You won't have any problem with it. Oh, great. Thanks. All right. And I have one other question real quick. Shoot. I, I also sent in a picture for um, a standalone tub yes. that I'm putting in, and it has a tubing that they're saying to insert into your existing drain. I'm thinking maybe I should take that out and put in... Um, PVC? What do you think? Okay, I'm just pulling this up now. Okay, so I'm looking at a jetted tub. 
and you've got water supply and water supply and then a pull-out faucet and you have a plug. And so what tube is it that they're expecting you to put into the very drain? bottom? It was hard to get a picture of it, but it's like a long, um, like corrugated pipe. It's like at the very bottom and it's a white, um, it's going to the left. Going to the left. Yeah, it's like an accordion looking tube. And they're saying there's a coupler that you basically take that accordion tube and put it in your existing drain and then tighten it with the coupler. Okay. Yeah. So that'll be the that'll be the drain for the tub. Well, is that okay or do I need the should I convert it? No, I would think that whenever you're having these kind of systems, the best thing to do is use whatever system they're giving you to integrate with your bathroom plumbing. Um, okay. Are you on CPVC or ABS? Uh, PVC. Okay. So if you're on PVC, um, the thread size is going to be exactly the same as the, what the tub is supplying you with. All right? Mm-hmm. If you have any questions about it, what you do is just take a picture with a tape measure on that mm-hmm. fitting, and you can go to the plumbing department and say, this is what I have for my tub. Give me the fittings that I need to go to and then whatever size, a, um, sorry, PVC t- plumbing you have. It may be one and a half, maybe two inch. So make sure you measure with a tape measure and take a picture. And if you go to the okay. store with pictures of your pipe with a tape measure on it, they'll be able to make sure they give you exactly the right fitting connections. All righty. All right, Thank because there's so inside and outside of pipes and all that kind of gets very confusing to, to communicate properly. So I always tell people, yeah. take a picture with the tape measure on the fitting and the pipe Okay. And then the guy in the store will have no problem hooking you up. Thank you. You're welcome, Yvette, and congratulations. That looks like a really nice tub. Thank you. Oh, I know. You're going to enjoy that. All right. We will talk to you again another time. Have a great one. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. All right. This Woo! Is easy. What? <laughs> the pictures are not easy to keep up with, eh? You know what? It's just going to take a little time. That's fine. I'll just uh, I'll keep everybody talking, give you more time. Hello, it's Jeff. You're on the air. Who are we talking to? Uh, howdy, Jeff. This is Oscar. Pleasure. I uh, appreciate you taking the call. Oh, my pleasure, Oscar. What can we do for you today? I saw you put in some pictures. Matt's going to load that up for us. What kind of project are you invested right now? Well, um, so right now, uh, so my home got flooded during Harvey, and I'm, I'm trying to do as much of all the work I can myself. Right. And I'm trying to get my replumb started. So I've got uh, galvanized plumbing, 1971. And um, what I'm trying to do is do a full conversion to PEX, and I've got a water, a whole house water filtration system that I'm trying to to put with it. I included the link in that email. Um, But what I'm trying to make sure I understand is, so first off, coming out of the, the inlet from the ground, um, I know PEX can't hold up to UV uh, exposure. So my question is, do, from the inlet, do I have to either start with PVC or CPVC? Um, and, uh, because it's just a cold water inlet. And then uh, if I can use PEX, do I just have to wrap it in insulation once it's done outside? Now, so there's the million-dollar question. <laughs> You're right, because PEX doesn't handle the, the UV rays. Now, I am sure in your area you're going to have a building code related to PEX on the exterior of your home. They're going to have a recommendation, whether it's an insulated pipe or a pipe wrap or something along that line. It's going to be treated kind of like electrical outside. It always needs a conduit to protect the wire from accidental damage. Um, I'm just not familiar with what the code is for PEX on the exterior to make that connection. That is going to be a challenge. Now, if you, if you want to know what the code is for that and not have to pay for it, best thing to do is just call your city or your state, whatever the uh, local building office is, and, and huh. tell them, listen, I'm going to be running this to my water supply. Um, what is the standard or what's the code? The other option is go get on the phone with the, uh, the plumbing supply company or you pop into the plumbing supply company, say, I'm going to do this connection, show them the picture, and then they'll go get all the fittings for you and tell you exactly what you need. Usually, if you go to these uh, plumbing supply stores, um, 
and I'm not talking about the, the construction variety stores like the Home Depot and the Lowe's. I'm talking like uh, do a Google search and find a supplier that's open. Like at Ferguson? S- Ferguson's would be perfect mix. Okay, you go there and you say, I'm looking for this kind of connection. What's the recommendation? They'll give you exactly what the code recommendation is for that because it's it changes state to state to state. And then you can be comfortable knowing that that's going to work. But you're right. The UV is the only issue. So logic would say that if there's some sort of cover to keep the UV from getting through, then it won't be a problem. Uh-huh. Right? It's just a matter of whatever the code requirement is for that cover. You just got to sort that out. I'm, I'm pretty handy. But, Oscar, I don't know every code for every situation all across the country. I'll tell you that right now. And I'm not going to pretend. Absolutely. I'm not going to pretend on the phone. <laughs> no, I, I appreciate that. All right. Okay. So then, I guess one one last question then. So if, if I, depending on whatever it ends up being, when you're dealing with potable water, does it have to be CPVC? No. As far as the drain or the supply lines. The supply lines. Yeah, no, we, we, we have three different supply lines in North America that are all accepted across the grid now, and that is copper, CPVC, and PEX. We don't use okay, CPVC so up here in Canada. We use copper and PEX only, um, but you have options. I don't, right. think there's any, I don't think there's any state ban against um, PEX anymore. There was in the early days because there was some pretty you know poor product being thrown in the market, but they they have since corrected all those issues. Got it. Uh, with, with pets, do you have anything bad to say about uh, Apollo piping? No, I don't have anything bad to say about anybody. Generally speaking, um, uh, it's it's six of one half dozen of the other, really, right? Gotcha. <laughs> I mean, right. if, if the company's big enough to have distribution of a product and they're going to have a warranty for it and it's been out for more than five years, then I, I don't get too suspicious after that. Awesome. All right. Awesome. Jeff, thank you so much. That's been a big help. My pleasure, Oz. Talk to you later, buddy. Take care. Bye-bye. All right. Well, that was interesting. Yes, I don't know everything and I don't pretend to. So if you have a question and I'm not capable of answering it, I'll be honest. Hello. Well, that didn't work out. Next one. Hello, you're on the air with Jeff. Who's this? Next call. Oh, I just answered nobody. (laughs) I'm still learning how to use the phone. That's awesome. Answer, speaker. Hello, you're on the phone with Jeff. Who's this? Hey, Jeff, this is Emmett. How are you? I'm good. How are you, my man? Very good, thanks. Um, Jeff, uh, it's in regards to a um, uh, door installation for an exterior door. Sure. I'm trying to do a side entrance uh, going into the basement. Yep. And approximately two weeks ago, I've sent you some uh, drawings and some questions, but uh, I have furthermore questions which I would like to address with you. Sure, well, look, so, give it a shot. Two, two weeks is a long time for my brain to retain information, but I'm going to do my best here. Yeah, well, first of all, I really appreciate what you're doing over here. Uh, you are like the friend that I can just call and ask, but professional help, so really appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, we'll do what we can. All right, so my question is in regards to, um, so my designer has the uh, provided me a drawing for a 36 by 80 rough opening yes the concrete door out yes so my question here is am i uh, cutting the concrete 36 by 38 leaving three inches of uh, gap for uh, for the door to be in the center well yeah I, I think i remember this email um the thing is 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 the designer asking for a 36 inch door or a 36 inch hole it's a 36-inch hole. Okay. A 36-inch hole is going to fit a 32-inch door on the exterior because the jams are much thicker than they are on the interior doors. Okay. Okay. So, so right. you're looking at a, a 36 and 83 hole. Is that the idea? 36, 83 hole. That's the question because um, the designer said 36 by 80. So... 
the confusion here is ah, I so. have a 36 <laughs> to 80 door. Yeah. Where's my three inches? That is confusing because if your hole is, if the designer's calling for 36 by 80, that's a door size. That's not a hole size. Jeff, yeah, I've just forwarded an email to you okay. uh, with the pictures again, uh, just so uh, you can recollect uh, the. Uh, so have you been on the phone to confirm this with the designer, if it's whether this is the door measurement or the hole measurement? Uh, That's yes. good. The designer said this is the hole measurement. And where the door opening will be, when I measure from the drywall to drywall, because there is a landing, it's a U landing going down, uh, there is exactly from drywall to drywall, I have a 35-inch uh, space. And that picture of the tape measure is where the proposed door is going? That's right. Okay, Matt, can I get the uh, drawing picture up on the screen for me? Okay, when I'm looking at this drawing, oof, that is brutal. Six foot six. That's a 78 inch height. Is that a. And then three feet is 36. Exterior light, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So they're, they're looking for a 36-inch hole. And can you scroll down just a bit, Matt? Oh, by a 78-inch. You're looking at ordering a custom door for this, aren't you? Mm, that's what it looks like. I'm not probably going to go that route. Because there's no such probably thing gonna... as a 78-inch exterior door just hanging around on the market. Right. Right? I'm probably just going to go with a... 32 or a 34 by 80. Okay, so if you want to know the, the, the limitation, the, the measurement on the interior is how many inches again from the corner to the, the trim? 35. 35? Okay. Um, if, if the interior cosmetics are not a concern, <laughs> right? Um, and is it facade brick and then you have a wood frame construction house or is that a stone wall that that you have there uh brick and uh uh just studs right okay so here's your here's your here's your issue you you don't want to open up on the inside to reframe a door area okay you've got to actually have framing in the right location. And it looks like on one side you're fine, possibly on the other. What is your building code for the, the smallest entry door you're allowed? Uh, I'm not entirely sure. I would start there. I would investigate, I would... what is the smallest door I'm allowed? Because if it was me, my best case scenario there is to go with a, a 32 inch door and leave the extra space so that I'm able to frame it properly. So, Jeff, I've applied for a permit, and yes. I've received an approval for it, okay. and the door approval I've received was for a 34 by 80. So we can work with that number. Yeah, you can probably work with that number, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to take, take up more space to frame it than what the interior is going to allow you to work with. Because in order to frame a 34-inch door, you need access to at least 40 inches of wall. You're going to get real creative there. Okay. Well, would it be simpler to go with a 34? I think it's simpler to open up that drywall and find out what you're looking at on the inside before you make a decision. Got it. Okay. Perfect. Find out what your framing limitations are before you order that door. Because if all you're doing is looking at drywall, you just really don't know what you're getting into. And you don't want to cut that brick and then go, oops, it's too big. Okay? So two right. things you need to know. What the framing scenario is on the other side of that drywall. And then what's the smallest door you can go with. And then you can take a look at, you know, what your, your best plan to move forward is. Because you don't want to do any of that twice when you're dealing with cutting through brick. Got it. All well, right. Thank you very much. I you're have welcome. a follow-up question, uh, uh, if that's all right, please. Yeah, sure, real quick. Okay, the follow-up question is uh, the clearance from the top to bottom. When I, uh, I'm going to be contracting just the brick cu uh, cutting portion off. Um, and my question is, where would the uh, bottom of the cut be? So if the door uh, panel...
panel is sitting uh, on the floor, yes. where, where we're stepping on, like how far down should I be cutting the brick? Okay, so you have a brick brick wall. So your door is going to come with a brick molding attached to the, the exterior of the door jamb. When you order that door, they're going to give you the exact dimension for the outside dimensions of that brick molding. That's where you want to cut because you want that brick molding set right in next to the brick so that you can seal up the gap with caulking from your brick molding to your brick. And then your door is actually going to be located where your thermal brick on your wall is. Okay, so that's the, that's the secret. Your lintel above your door is going to be based on that brick molding scenario. Because you don't want to have a gap from your brick mold to the lintel of more than half an inch. And you don't want a gap more than half an inch on either side either. So you, you, you order that door based on the jam size that works with your hole on the interior. Your, your custom door company is going to give you the actual dimension of your brick molding right out of the gate. And then while you're waiting six or eight weeks for that door to be delivered, you've got time to get your brick guy in there. Cut the hole according to the brick molding and it's on that door, okay? He'll remove a couple of half bricks near the top, install the lintel, put those bricks back in with new mortar, and then you're ready to roll. Okay, and about the bottom plate, so where the hardwood sits on the stairs, mm -hmm. when I'm cutting the, I'm cutting the bottom uh, portion of the brick, yes. where the door would sit, would that be uh, a few inches below? Like, am I placing the door right on the concrete or am I placing it on a 2 by 4 pressure treated wood with like blue skin? Yeah, I, I'd have to see a picture of the exterior of your house. But in most cases, your door is going to be sitting on your floor joist package with the OSB, okay? And that's going to be above your concrete. Got it. Right? Perfect. That clears up everything. Yeah. And so then that'll be your height. So when, you, when you're all finished, you're going to have brick above and below the door, right? So you're actually cutting like a, like a hole in your brick, like a window. <laughs> okay. Okay? All right. Thanks uh, a lot for, right. uh, for your answers, Chef. The other option is, is you can cut the brick all the way down to the concrete, and you can replace the section under the door with like a, an aluminum um, facade or something, just so that you can have... Uh, all that flexibility during construction but you know if you have a, your custom door sizes from your manufacturer for the the total outside finish dimensions you should be able to do surgery on a brick wall like you're doing a heart transplant shouldn't be an issue all right all right Sounds good thank you very much you're welcome my friend we'll talk to you again good luck thank you all right there we go i managed to hang up before i got that horrible sound learning how to use a phone today ladies and gentlemen all right it is 12 30 and here we go again Hello, you're live with Jeff. Who am I talking to? Hey, Jeff, it's James. James. Yes. I, I say that like I, I, I wasn't. it's been a while. How you doing? Good, good. <laughs> yeah, I was afraid I wasn't going to get through. I sent some pictures in an email. Yep. Oh, you've uh, got yourself an old lath and plaster beauty. Yeah, it's awful. Nice. <laughs> So my question is, uh, I took some pictures where the old wiring was coming through. Yes. And the, the top plate is blocking me from moving those wires up any higher on the ceiling. Uh, so what I want to do is actually build the wall out maybe another inch mm -hmm. and hide those wires behind the wall. Am I able to do that? Okay, so let's just stop right there, Matt. That's a good picture. We'll give everybody who's listening a chance to catch up with our phone call. Okay, so that last piece of lath stripping that's above the wires, is it? Right. Not, if you remove that, is that what you're saying? Behind that, you've got studs and then a top plate? Yep, okay. exactly. And so in a perfect world, the real question is, is that top plate structural? Uh, yeah, I mean, I know this is a load-bearing wall. Okay, so we'll call it structural then. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, you're, you've got an option here. Um, that's only a couple inches from the top of the ceiling, right? What room is it that we're looking at there? This is our kitchen. That's the kitchen? And previously, they had a drop ceiling. So one yep. of the pictures you can, and actually, 
Um, just, uh, well, one of the pictures you can see there was some uh, furring strips that they had on the ceiling. Yep. Uh, where they hung the drop ceiling from. Um, so right we there, talked man. about, well, maybe we'll build the ceiling down, but then we'd have to build it down three inches. Okay. And I was so, like, well, I don't want to build, I don't yeah. want to lose any more ceiling space. So no, no, exactly. Build the wall out in two inch, one or two inches. Do you have a design to put in upper cabinets in that kitchen? Um, just, just two, two cabinets on this wall. Um, and they're only about four foot long. So okay, so would cover the whole wall. The same wall that you're putting your cabinets on is where your electrical issue is in that top corner. Yes. Are you going to be building a facade box, or are you just going to finish the cabinets as close to the ceiling with crown molding and call it like that? Um, they're not going to go all the way to the ceiling. They're not going all the way to the ceiling. So, what if you built just a uh, like a bulkhead box? Instead of building the whole wall out, just did a perimeter box around the whole kitchen. Something that's uh, uh, like maybe three or four inches down and about eight inches wide. And just do a perimeter box around the kitchen. You can tuck all your wiring up in there. And if you want, and you're real creative, you can even toss in a, make it a little wider and toss in a couple of pots or something. But in kitchens, to have a little bulkhead box on a wall or something, it's not uncommon and it's not going to be ugly. I would do that long before I lost a few inches on my wall depth. That makes a whole lot more sense. Right? Yeah. You're really looking for a cosmetic solution to a structural problem. Yeah. Right? And so if you can incorporate that cosmetic solution into part of the design and make it intentional, then then that really becomes, you know, spectacular too. So if, okay. you, if you're working on your design and your lighting scheme, see, check with your whoever is working with your design with you. Should, if you make a box, can we incorporate lighting in that box? I'm, just, I'm doing all the design work. <laughs> That's my man. All right, James, I get it. So um, since you're doing that, the lights for bringing light to a, a functional space like a countertop, generally we bring the light to about 18 inches. So it's, it's okay. past any upper cabinets, and it's in front of your face, so when you're working at the counter, the light is there without shadows. Right. So while you're doing that design, if you're going to put a box on that wall, put a box on, on, on both walls that have cabinets, okay? And then make it at least 20 inches out and only three or four inches down, right? You can just do that out of two by fours. Right. Just a couple of two by fours, throw all the drywall on there, run a couple of pot lights to different locations that you're going to want, and it'll look very intentional that that's what you were doing to bring the lighting, and then you won't have to be busting around with all the lath and plaster on the ceiling in order to run your pot lights too. Oh yeah. And I like then it. now, now, now you, you're now your brain's going crazy with all kinds of options for the rest of your house. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> all right, my man. Well, listen, James, I'm glad to be able to help you. Got another quick question for us, or are you good? No. That, well, actually, uh, super quick. I, I posted a question in the chat. Yes. Um. So we we want to add a main floor bathroom um we don't have a bathroom at all yes and there are no videos on the internet for people adding a bathroom there's all kinds of videos about renovations right do you guys have any plans for a, a video on like r roughing in a bathroom where there previously wasn't one <sighs> wow um yeah you know, that's not a terrible idea. It's not as big a market, so it, it's not going to address enough people. But okay. do you know where your stack is in your house going into the basement? I do, but it's so far away, we're going to have to add a new stack as well. So, so we'll, that's we'll just as easy. So everything. Yeah, so from the floor down, you need three-inch pipe. Right. From your bathroom up, one and a half. You don't need big pipe to get fresh air. One pipe that's an inch and a half wide, ABS or CPVC, will bring enough fresh air for 10 fixtures. Okay, so if you can find a way to get an inch and a half pipe all the way up into the attic and then tie into your stack there, which is most likely cast. Am, am I got that right? Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. You can actually... Um, 
You might even be better off to just put a brand new fresh air exhaust on the house. Okay? And okay. it's easier to, to fix the roof than it is to fix the cast to tie into. I'll just say that way. Right. Right? So if you added that, and then then you're also set for a, a renovations in the future with any upstairs bathroom, now you've got another vent you can tie into real quickly. So then you can eliminate right. the old cast at a later date. Okay? And, that, and that's another future plan as well. Yeah. So if you're looking long-term plans on, the, on a major overhaul, introduce a brand new fresh air intake for your plumbing system that abs is brilliant because you can run that through the attic and you can go a thousand feet before you have to have any concern about fresh air right it's not an issue okay. so you can run it clear across the attic to the other side of the house and then you can tie in all your new plumbing to the new fresh air vent and eliminate that old heavy cast that's laying around okay all right so that's really all you need you just need if you're going to be going into and putting in a new drain pipe then Getting that 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 one and a half inch pipe up an interior wall that's that's the real trick, that's all you got. And that can be as simple more, as putting a box in a corner of the room and running the pipe up that inside corner. Yeah, I, and I think that's what probably what we're going to end up doing, kind of like this bulkhead idea you just gave me. Yeah, instead of horizontal, go vertical. Right. Yeah. Um, but I think where we're running into issues is trying to run the pipes through the flooring, through the joists and stuff, and trying to get the all that worked out. And there's just no videos on how to route plumbing through existing floor joists. Right. What's, what's, underneath the, what's underneath your main floor? Is it a, a basement that's actually used? It's a crawl space area. A crawl space area. Okay, so when you're running your, your pipe under your, your, your floor joists, just run it below the height of your joist package. And strap it to the underside of it. Oh. And that'll give you all the flexibility in the world. Okay. It's okay. Yeah, if if your toilet drops from your floor to the first elbow, and if it's a one-foot drop, it makes no difference than if it's only six or eight inches. Okay. So keep it simple for yourself and and strap your three-inch pipe underneath your floor joist package in your crawl space, and then just bring it up to where you need it. Okay. All right? All right. Perfect. Cool, James. Pleasure. I could talk old houses all day long. Maybe we'll have to do a show just on old houses. Get James in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we'll get you back. <laughs> you can give us an update on how things are going. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right, my friend. We'll talk to you again another time. Cheers. Okay. All right. Well, there we go. That's how oh, I love old houses. There's just not enough of them around this country. There's only about half a million. <laughs> all right. Let's get on with this. Hello. Hello. Hello, it's Jeff here. Who am I speaking with? How's it going? It's Josh. Hi, Josh. Can you turn uh, the, the sound off on your computer, your phone, or whatever you're listening to there? I certainly can, yep. Appreciate it, bud. <laughs> we got a time lapse, so it's, we yeah, have a delay yeah. of about five seconds, it seems. <laughs> no worries. All right. Um, so I've got a question. Uh, I've got, I'm doing a bad thing here. I've got the <laughs> sink under the window. Okay. Okay, so right now the kitchen is fully gutted right down to the studs. Yes. Four inch studs. Yep. And um, currently... Now, uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's back up. This house. Josh, you said four-inch studs. How old is your house? Uh, it's from the 60s. So it's two by four. But Okay, so it's two by four, but it's probably it's three and a half. It's two by four, yeah. Sorry, not four-inch studs. Just okay. standard two by four. All right. Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and so it's wood siding outside. Okay. And uh, what they did was they brought a four-inch copper pipe for the air vent and ran it outside the house. Yes, right under the window. Yes, right under the window. And Lovely the window. when you, probably right um, where you parked your car, too. <laughs> it's on the back side, actually, right on the porch. <laughs> I've seen that, and that's a lovely surprise when you get out to visit someone. Yes, it's beautiful outside. Um, so what I'm hoping to do is run a one-and-a-half-inch air vent below the window inside, but I have to cut the studs. Okay. So I'm wondering if that is, is going to cause any problems with air or... Man, okay, so let's let's discuss your house first. Is it a one story or two story? Batter just dead. Oh, nuts! So this is all my fault. The battery's dead. Josh, I know you're still listening, so let's let's go through this the old-fashioned way. Um, okay, so I can't ask you a question, so I'm going to assume if it's a two-story house, 
your your exterior wall is structural. You can't cut through it. All right. Um, the only thing you can do is you can run your vent through the kitchen cabinets until you're past the window and bring that back into the wall. Now, you're probably going to have a dishwasher next to the sink. So check the other direction. A lot of cabinets, if you have even drawers in it, at the top left corner of the cabinet, there's enough space for the drawer to function and you can still run piping inside the cabinet. That's how you can reroute your venting. So one house story. Okay. Story All right, thanks, Josh. I see you in the, in the chat here. So it's a one-story house. Um, if it's on the gable side, all right, which is look at the peak, that's gable side. If it's on the soffit side, soffit side is structural load. All right, so same rules apply. If it's on the soffit side, it's structure. You've got to run your pipe through your cabinets. And for anybody who's got situations like this, the best place to run your venting is through your cabinets. Why you would want to start cutting out your studs, I have no idea. So you have a window. You got your sink down here, right? You have a dishwasher over here, or let's say. The other side, all you got to do is just get past the, the two studs where the window is, and there'll be a wall cavity there. Open up that section of the wall. Identify that you can get your venting up into your attic. And then when you're doing your kitchen layout, you have your drain connection here under the window, and you bring your vent, and you just leave it there capped. Okay? And then you put in your cabinets, and then you connect your drains after you've installed your cabinets. Your venting, sorry. And that works amazing. Oh, yeah. I'm, hopefully that helps. But you know what? Running a one and a half inch pipe just underneath the height of a finished cabinet on the interior is not going to affect your storage or the function of the venting system. So that'll work. All right. And trust me, you want that. You don't want to have your fresh air anywhere below your window because then you can't open your window <laughs> without all that. So, all right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I apologize that we are not going to have a phone, but I am going to stick it out for the next few minutes and finish this thing up the old-fashioned way. Uh, Josh says he's planning on buying an IKEA kitchen. It won't interfere with anything with them, will it? Mm. When you're when you're doing your kitchen, Josh, all you got to do is remember your you have a back rail installation on that cabinet. Okay, so when you're planning for your vent. Your kitchen counter height is 36 inch. Bring your venting out at, uh, I would suggest, 30 inches off the ground. And then if that interferes with any drawers or anything else, it's a lot easier to lift it up a little bit than to stretch it out afterwards. Because you can open the wall in that one spot before you put in all your drawer package. Um, so if you're going to go with the, the big pot drawers, when you go to Ikea... Don't get the high back pot drawer. Sorry, there's the camera. You have different options. So if you go with two drawers on that IKEA cabinet, the back of that pot drawer is only still six inches tall, even though the drawer is like 15. So you're going to have lots of room. So just drop that vent coming out of the wall 30 inches off the floor, and you will be just fine. All right. Maddie, I need to see some chat, buddy. <laughs> David McCormick just joined the membership program. Welcome to Money in the Bank. All right. Questions, questions, questions. Uh, I am taking questions in the chat now, guys. So let's just get right up to date with that, Matt. Uh, wow. You got a house from 1960. You got no wall insulation. Plaster walls, how to add it. All right. So there's only two options. Well, three. From the outside... Rip off all the plaster, or you can drill holes in the plaster in between all the stud bays and blow it in, okay? It's 90% effective. It's going to disappoint a little bit, especially over time because it starts to sag and settle, but it will give you a much better result than what you have now. And if you have no insulation in your walls from 1960, you're somewhere in the country where you have the ability to heat your home and it's not going to be the end of the world, but it's really hard on your air conditioning in the summertime. So getting that blown in insulation is going to make a dramatic effect with your air conditioning system and the comfort level of your house. Um, the heating, it'll help a little bit, but you're going to notice it even more in the summer. All right, Josh, thank you very much. Dude, I got you, man. 
uh, that was tricky, but uh, I'm glad that that's the solution because running a pipe in your cabinets, ladies and gentlemen, is a lot easier than running your pipe in your wall. Um, okay, you're my hero. Oh, why did I read that? Would you put a vapor barrier back in a room that had a ton of mold, in particular the ceiling? I don't want to take out the barrier behind the walls, but all possible. Okay, so let's talk about vapor barrier real quick. Depending where you live, if you if you get winter like I do, you need a vapor barrier on just just on the inside of the insulation before you put drywall. If you're in the south, you need vapor barrier on the outside of your house. Okay, if you live somewhere in between, like let's say. Um, like uh, Nashville or Southern or Kentucky or, um, or you're in Northern Maine. Okay, so yeah, Northern Maine, you definitely got Northern climate weather. You definitely want your vapor barrier, without a doubt, okay? If you have mold and you have a vapor barrier, you have another kind of problem. Man, you want to find out the source of that water because it's not coming from inside the house unless it's in a bathroom that doesn't have a fan. Right? You're going to have to give me a little bit more information. Where is the water damage occurring? Hey, cheers. Making money, Mike G. <laughs> um, yeah, it was plumbing. Okay, so if it's a plumbing leak, there you go. The, there's nothing wrong with your vapor barrier system. If you have a plumbing leak, your problem is your plumbing. Make sure your plumbing is on the inside of your, your vapor barrier. So you're going to have framing, insulation, vapor barrier, then plumbing. All right? If it's on the wrong side then you're going to be subject to thaw free cycles and the plumbing is going to be affected and destroy wood paneling on the drywall with barrier behind it yeah okay folks um if you have vapor barrier and you have winter you got to have your plumbing on the interior side of the plastic because it's an air barrier as well all right here's the thing lots of people for a lot of years ran the plumbing in the wall and they thought as long as it was on the interior side of the insulation would be fine. And then they put the plastic over top. And in theory, it works great until you get a mouse. And then they make a tunnel. And they bump into the plumbing, and then they just move around it. But what they've done there now is they've introduced all that really cold air in the wintertime, blowing straight on the pipe in one spot, and it will freeze, and then it will burst. And then you are done. So... Yeah, definitely integrate your plastic back the way you had it. It's definitely critical in northern Maine. And seal it up with some of that blue tape, and it'll go really good. Uh, we have a, a super chat here. Number one fan. Uh-huh. It looks like a dancing pear. What is up with that? that is, <laughs> that's funny. All right. Uh, Jillian Anderson has a question. The cracks forming on my ceiling seem like it's where the drywall was installed. Is that fixable without tearing the ceiling apart? Okay. Jillian, this is going to be interesting. If you have drywall cracks where the drywall meets other drywall, it's because there are not enough screws into a backing. If the joint is just floating, okay, and they just taped it, then there's going to be movement in the house, and your, your drywall is going to crack. Ah. Uh, Winter time does a lot of really funny things to a house because the structure itself freezes that's outside the insulation. And so things do move around. When you have a drywall joint, you want to have wood on that joint that you can screw both sides to so they move together and then they won't crack. If you have cracks in your drywall joints, it's usually because of a faulty installation. The best way to check is try to install a screw on each side of the crack on a little bit of an inward angle and see if it bites into something. If it bites into something, then do that again every 12 inches along that crack, and then you can fix your crack. And that is going to be as simple as just using drywall compound and then painting it. Because if there's already tape and compound there, but it's cracking, you can repair that without going to all kinds of extent of new taping and everything else. So just see if there's you can get a bite with a screw, and then you'll be okay. Can you add ground wire to a knob and tube wiring no rip that stuff out of your house and start over okay it's just not worth the aggravation it's not worth the risk of having a fire if you have knob and tube wiring in your house the first thing you do before you buy groceries is get new wiring okay i'm not screwing around with that 
That stuff is so old at this point, it should be illegal to even buy a house with it. It should be illegal to turn the lights on if you have knob and tube wiring. That stuff is that dangerous. I'm telling you right now, especially in the winter time. Now we got all the mice and everything are running into the houses looking for a place to live. Knob and tube wiring, they're just going to run along and go, mmm, nummy, take a bite, blow up, start themselves on fire. That's how a lot of fires happen in old houses. It's mice. They literally just, they just combust right there on the spot. All right? All that little fur, it's a little kindling, and it's an old dry house. Ah, uh, please, just get that junk out of your house. It was a lovely invention compared to burning torches in a cave, okay? But we've moved a long way from there. Get that out of your house. Uh, any tips on bending aluminum for cladding, brick mold, or an attic vent door? Yes, Tom. There's a lovely machine that's called a brake. It makes perfect aluminum bends. I don't own a brake. What I do have is a company in town, and shout out to the Aluminum Vinyl Warehouse. You can go there with measurements, and they have all that stuff in stock, and you can give them the length and the angles and the dimensions and the cuts. They'll do it all up for you in about an hour or two. You just go out for your trip, drop off your information, pay for it, pick that stuff up on the way back to the house and install it. Let them do it for you, okay? Most people, even if they could rent the brake from the Home Depot, aren't going to be proficient in using it without a lot of work. And it's not worth the hundreds and hundreds of dollars of materials while you're fiddling around trying to figure it all out and all the aggravation. Pay the extra 30 or 40 bucks and have these guys bend it for you. You'll thank me for it. All right. Five bucks for the next cup of coffee and temp toilet plug. <laughs> I love that. Uh, Jeff Boyd, he can't rip out the wiring. He doesn't own the house. Oh, well, there you go. You got a perfect excuse to rent something else. Seriously. Jeff, I mean, if you're by yourself, that's one thing. If you have family members with you, um, can I just say the most responsible thing to do if you have a family is get the hell out of there. It's dangerous. It is dangerous. Those houses with knob and tube wiring are also constructed without fire breaks. They're also constructed with 100-year-old timber. They're also constructed with enough fresh air access because it's balloon frame construction from the roof that a fire will burn and burn and burn, and you won't even notice it until your house is fully engulfed. No. It's messed up. Are we wrapping it up? How much longer? Yeah, I think so. What are we at? One o'clock? All right. Well, we promised two hours. All right. Good answer. Yeah, get the hell out. Um, it's just not worth it. I'd sooner live in a tent and, and light candles in the wintertime than live in a house with knob and tube wire. Um, and I'm a safety second kind of guy, right? Like, that's just... <laughs> What were the results from your hearing test? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> what hearing test? Yeah, I'm going to get one. I haven't done it yet. I still am deaf. All right. Um, oh, my subscription was canceled by us. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, we don't cancel subscriptions. Um, if you become a member, you also have to unbecome a member all by yourself i don't have the ability to dictate that one way or another i'm so i'm not sure what happened there but like with all things youtube it's such a huge growing machine that glitches happen so if you were canceled and you want to join the membership again just hit the join button again all right. you want to do one more? we'll do one more question actually hang on we'll answer this one and we'll do for the next 30 seconds i'm putting your questions i'm going to pick one more after this back it up to that uh, jeffrey guy there matt We'll do his question there. All right. Uh, Jeff, do you have any drywall suggestions to make a new wall with new drywall that meets an existing finished outside corner, also drywall, and has one eighth of flush appearance? Bah. So it was kind of feet. Yeah, I have a suggestion, Jeffrey. Um, send me a picture of what you're talking about. Maybe it's just because I've been doing this for the last two hours. My brain is just, it's just seeing like a spinning wheel, like Austin Powers going back in time right now. I just can't make sense of that. All right. So Bill has a question, and it, by God, he's willing to pay to get the answer. So let's do there. Hallway wall. We want to convert to a railing. Has an outlet. Okay. What about brass screw outlet horizontal on bottom rail, or how bad would it look for a partial height wall just for outlet than rail wow sent pics in the email 
All right, well, let's take a look. Is there anything new? Matt, I'm a little confused. Yeah, me too. Is it, it was it Bill? Is that what he said? Maybe he sent it a little while ago. Bill. Yeah, Bill Fellner. Put in his name. There he goes. Doppelganger. Okay. We got we got pics on that email. Okay. So now I see what we're talking about. So we got a half wall. Yeah, with with and it's got a plug in it. All right. Okay, so let's go back to the question. <laughs> you got to bear with us. This is quite the process. All right, so Bill, we got a wall. I don't need to see the picture. I need to see the question. All right. So you want to get rid of that and put in uh, like a regular spindle handrail? And you want to know what to do with that plug. And here's the easy answer for that. That plug, that wire, is most likely coming from the plug underneath it in the other floor. Or it's in a circuit. So you've got this half wall, right? And you've got another wall here. And here's the stairs. You've got a plug here. That plug power is either coming from straight down and it's on a wall underneath it, or it's coming around the corner from over here. All you do to identify that is you turn off the breaker for the upstairs hall or the downstairs living room or whatever it is and test to see which, which breaker that plug is on. Once you've identified that, you know which direction it's coming from, okay? You can then go to that plug with the breaker off, take it off the wall, all right? Take all the four wires off that plug, okay? Cap them, <laughs> turn the breaker back on, Identify which one has the power and put that black and that white back on the plug and you can eliminate that power altogether in that hallway on that and just put in a railing. Now, the reason it's there is because the code requires a plug for every so many feet of solid wall. There is a plug on the other side of the hall on the same wall. If you got a vacuum plug, you're going to be fine. So that's how you do that, okay? It's a couple of steps. So identify which power supply it's coming from, from the room beneath or around the corner. Kill the power, pull the plug, disconnect that line, rip it out, and then you can pull out that entire wall and put in a nice banister. You don't have to worry about having power sitting there. All right, guys, it's been fun. <laughs> this is a lot of fun. I'm going to have to do this again. Uh, real quick, in the comments. I want to know what is the best, hey, you're welcome, Bill. What is the best time and what is the best day to do this sort of thing? All right? Quick vote. Do you want a Saturday morning, Saturday night, Friday night? Um, and by night, I mean like early evening because I ain't doing this too late at night. I'm getting old. No, don't leave. I have to leave. I haven't had anything to eat yet today and I need sustenance. Um, okay. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Every day, 8 to 5. Saturday morning, Saturday night, Saturday morning, Saturday night, Saturday a.m., Saturday a.m., Friday night, Saturday morning. Okay, so we're getting lots of votes. Saturday seems to work good for everybody. So I'll tell you what we're going to do. Uh, an hour later than I started today, something more like noon. Oh, oh. Okay. What we'll do is we'll just kind of keep scheduling these at different times. We'll move it around a little bit so that it, it, it satisfies more people over. Yeah, Saturday morning wins. Yay. Thank you. Appreciate that, everybody. Now, listen, if you miss the live show, you can always go into the YouTube studio or your, your homepage and look at videos. There's a live section, and you can research all those live videos, and you can follow along at any time that suits your convenience. But... Uh, yeah, eat first. I wish. I got up this morning. I dove on to my member comments, and that's where I'm going now. So if you've given us an email, I'm going to answer it before the weekend is over, I promise, all right? I really got to just buckle down and get it done. Uh, good thing for me. The weather's lousy, so I'm going to just get that out of the way because we only have a few days next week with weather that's conducive to fixing up that farmhouse, which, by the way, is almost done. 
And if you haven't yet, you should join us on Instagram because we are giving you updates as we go. And another shout out, if you haven't seen the video from our other channel that went out last night, you got to check it out. Reality Renovation, folks. Project videos. Um, it's, it's really, it's a lot of fun. It's some of our best content ever. And we're just about to hit the 100,000 uh, subscriber on that channel. And we'll get another one of these, only it'll be silver and a lot smaller. It'll be kind of cool. Anyway, we will see you again next time. Um, let's do this again in two weeks. Maddie, can you mark that down and hold me accountable? Boom, two weeks. Wow, people are throwing money at me still. Thanks, Eric. I uh, appreciate that. That'll buy me a coffee. That's a large triple-triple sitting right there. All right. We'll see you again. Jeff is out. Boom. Oh.